Okay, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Mario Novelli. I'm the director of the Centre for International Education and co-PI of the Peer Network. Um, welcome everyone to week seven of the Peer Network lecture series on the political economy of education in times of conflict, crisis and, and pandemics. This is a GCRF AHRC funded network between the Centre for International Education, the University of Sussex, the University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan, and the University of Ulster, and aims to promote engagement with critical political economy analysis of education in contexts of conflict and crisis. The lecture series is also supported by UCFIET, the UK Forum on International Education and Training. All of our lectures are live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards, and will become part of a free open source resource for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge and practice about the political economy of education. Please sign up to our YouTube, uh, our CIE YouTube. Um, I'm very happy to say that today's session is led by Professor Mehmet Ur from the University of Greenwich and Dr. Birgul Kutan, University of Sussex. The title of this session is Academics for Peace and the Political Economy of Repression in Turkey's Higher Education Sector. Before I introduce them, I want to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules and logistics. Please mute yourselves unless you are asking a question in the Q&A. Q Please ask any questions during the talk through the chat function and I'll collate those and come back later to request you to ask the question. Um, the talk, they will talk for around 35 to 40 minutes. We'll then have a seven minute Sussex buzz in small breakout rooms so that you can reflect on the content of the lecture. We'll then come back as a plenary, uh, uh, as a group for a plenary Q&A. We'll try to finish around 2.15 p.m. UK time. Um, just a few words of introduction. Uh, professor Mehmet Orr is a professor of economics and institutions and a specialist in political economy at the University of Greenwich, which he joined in 1990. He has led a number of research projects funded by the European Commission, the Department for International Development, the Economic and Social Research Council. He's also a convener for the Cochrane and Campbell Collaborations Economics Methods Group and coordinator of the Center for Economic Performance, Governance and Regulation in the Business School and has published widely. Apart from an exemplary academic career, Mehmet is also a political activist and has spent several years in prison for his activism in Turkey before coming to the UK and building a life for himself and his family. He remains active in politics in Turkey, a regular contributor to media outlets uh, in Turkey and Europe, and is himself a signatory to the Academics for Peace statement that is the focus of this lecture that led to so many academics becoming persecuted and imprisoned. He has a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. Uh, Dr. Birgul Kutan is a researcher at the University of Sussex and is currently leading research on a case study of HDK, the People's Democratic Congress in Turkey for a four country ESRC funded study on learning and knowledge production in social movements that explores social movement learning in Turkey, Colombia, Nepal, and South Africa. And uh, this lecture today is tangential to some of the research and part of the data that was gathered during that period. After working for the Turkish Human Rights Association in Turkey, Birgül came to the UK in the late 1990s. She has two master's degrees in development studies and society and space and a PhD in human geography from the University of Bristol. The Zoom is yours, Mehmet. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be part of this uh, peer network lecture series. Um, uh, I followed some of the sessions and uh, I hope we will rise to the expectations that the series has uh, established. We will uh, do this in, 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 in a couple of parts, a few parts. First, we will... Uh, st I'll start with uh, 
uh, background to the Academics for Peace uh, initiative in, in Turkey. And my focus will be really on uh, some issues that remain behind the blind spot in conventional political academy, political economy of higher education research, uh, so-called modernization theory. Uh, my presentation starts with an observation uh, that the modernization theory's emphasis on higher education as a bulwark against uh, autocracy uh, is well known. And there are two uh, uh, arguments, two main arguments in this debate. One is that uh, authoritarian, regi authoritarian regimes uh, tend to uh, be hostile towards higher education in general, education in general, and higher education in particular, because they, they argue that the higher the level of education, the lower the probability of authoritarian or uh, regimes or military coups or uh, autocracies. And knowing that, authoritarian regimes tend to uh, uh, distance itself or underfund the higher education. The other argument in this debate is that disaffected higher education graduates and intellectuals are usually important actors or opposition actors against uh, non-democratic regimes. I think uh, although there are examples of academics, intellectuals, participation in resistance uh, against anti-democratic regimes, uh, the, the, the attempt to, to, to depict a picture of higher education system as a, as a, as a, as a source of uh, uh, resistance for democracy or demand for democracy is misplaced because there is equally important evidence suggesting that uh, higher education graduates uh, or higher education staff or institutions uh, are under the influence of uh, the autocratic or otherwise regimes. Uh, these regimes and the states in general uh, tries to win the allegiance of the intelligentsia uh, by uh, uh, various means. Also, they make sure or they try to ensure that the higher education system produces an army of, uh, of conformist graduates. Uh, and these graduates are usually uh, employed in the reproduction of the autocratic rules. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the uh, education background of the people who sustain the Trump autocracy, uh, you will see a lot of evidence in that, let alone countries like Turkey or, or, or China, where the uh, state intervention and design of the higher education is more obvious. Uh, what's the evidence emerging globally on this uh, conformity and complicity? Uh, University management and regulatory higher education bodies are at the forefront in many countries of the assault against academic freedom. We saw that in Turkey, we saw that in Hungary, uh, there is evidence of that in, in China and uh, Russia and other countries. Science departments uh, are striking al al alliances with authoritar authoritarian regimes or governments in general to close down or marginalize social science and humanities departments, particularly those engaged in the production of critical knowledge. Uh, even in Europe and elsewhere where uh, the regime is not openly autocratic, university managers and academics 
many academic colleagues are encouraging and engineering the encroachment of neoliberalism into universities, particularly uh, under the, 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 the trend known as managerialism in, in, in higher education. Now, coming back to Turkey. Now, the state fetishism and nationalism in Turkey, what I call, is, is, is about the naked, naked attempt at designing and shaping uh, higher education in the image of a nationalist, xenophobic, and uh, monolithic Turkish state. The preamble to the Turkish constitution says no protection shall be afforded to thoughts or opinions later amended as activity contrary to Turkish national interest, existence, Turkey, existence of Turkey as a monolithic state and historical and moral values of Turkishness. This is the most blatant statement of nationalism and xenophobia that you can see in any, in any constitution in the world. The state of Turkey with its territory and nation is an indivisible entity. Its language is Turkish. The reference here is against the Kurd. This is a fixture of the Turkish constitution since 1923. Uh, denial of the existence of other ethnicities uh, in Turkey, apart from those recognized under the laws and agreement, which are usually religious minorities and the Armenians. Uh, it is also for, forbidding the use of other languages than Turkish official. More than that, these uh, article, uh, articles and the preambles are irrevocable. No government or no majority you have in the, in the parliament is enough to, to, to change this. Uh, unless you have a very strong social movement behind, behind the demand for change. Uh, this state fetishism and nationalism is translated directly into the higher education law. The aim of the higher education law, higher education, is to educate students so that they are conscious of the privilege of being a Turk. This is again the most blatant a statement of, of nationalism and ideology-driven education. Uh, the aim of the higher education is also to enhance the welfare of the Turkish state, not the Turkish citizens, the Turkish state. Of course, this framework has meant that resistance to uh, state fetishism and monolithism, nationalism in Turkish higher education has been punished heavily. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the resistance to that, but the picture as of last year was that there were more than 70 students, 70,000 students in jails, most of them Kurdish. Now, how did we come here? We came here because historically, majority of academics in Turkey, and I'm here maybe uh, generalizing a, a bit, but uh, I would stand behind my statement. Most of the academics in Turkey, uh, I'm sorry to say that, uh, have been the products and reproducers of nationalism in Turkey. There has been uh, exceptions, which I will talk, these academics are usually mediocre. They have conformed and collaborated with the state design to secure promotion and uh, status. They have functioned as ideologues and ra uh, rather than the producers of, 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 of uh, critical thinking. Uh, the constitution that I cited earlier, the Turkish higher education law are all drafted by low school graduates in Turkey. And they were awarded professorship even though they don't have any international publication. 
usually. Anyway, the picture is not dark all the times. There have been an honorable minority, has been an honorable minority that always took risk, defended academic freedom. There are examples stretching back to the 1960s. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, sociologists like Beija Boran, Niazi Berkes, etc., have raised the demands for academic freedom argued for critical thinking, and they were punished. This was uh, continued in 1970s, uh, and therefore, after the military coup 1971, uh, uh, lots of academics, including some of the names that I mentioned here, Jakob Kepenek, who was my economics teacher in uh, Metu, Bahri Savju, Korkut Borata, who was, who still uh, active uh, economist in Siyasal Bilgiler Fakultesi, Bülent Tanner, Ismail Beşikçi, a, a, a foremost researcher on Kurdish issue in Turkey or Kurdish uh, problem. Uh, then in 1980s and 90s, uh, this ex resistance expanded as more and more academics uh, from Turkey uh, established contacts, secured uh, funding for studying abroad and bringing in the standards that they have been trained with, in, with, with their uh, uh, professors, which are usually critical uh, academics, to Turkey. Also, student activism increased. Uh, students staged boycotts, occupations, they established links with trade unions and grassroots resistance to ensure that the mediocrity and the uh, conformity with Turkish nationalist agenda did not uh, dictate what they what they learn and what they study in higher education. Uh, I had the good fortune of being involved one two of these boycotts, one of which lasted for six months and one lasted for nine months in the Middle East Technical Universities. The first boycott led to the first, very first establishment of student uh, council. The second occupation uh, derailed the state project to uh, appoint a fascist nationalist uh, rector to the university. Uh, one observation I have, and I shared this several times, shared this several times so far, the research and teaching quality has been higher, consistently higher, in universities and faculties where there was a resistance against state nationalism and fetishism. In all others, uh, as you go up in the conformity scale, the quality of teaching and the quality of research goes down. Uh, Academics for Peace uh, initiative emerged uh, against this background in Turkey. Uh, when the Turkish government uh, bombed and shelled Kurdish towns and cities in, 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 in 2016, early 2016, uh, more than 2,000 academics issued a declaration calling for an end to the state violence in Kurdish provinces for drawing a roadmap that would lead to a lasting peace uh, in Turkey and allowing independent observers to monitor the Kurdish uh, areas by uh, the Kurdish uh, towns and cities destroyed by security forces. This was too much for the autocratic regime of Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, and uh, Justice and Development Party. Uh, they initiated a concerted attack by the presidency, the government, the higher education council, and the research council. Massive witch hunt, which led to uh, mass dismissals, persecution, what we call social debt, uh, meaning exclusion from the labor market and other issues that uh, maybe will come, uh, will be mentioned by Virgil. 
Now I'll stop here and Virgil will take us through the Bach experience and its uh, uh, connection with the social moment experience in Turkey. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mehmet, for this uh, introduction and a link the background to um, what I'm going to talk now. Um, before I talk, I want to say thank you to Mario also organizing and providing us this space and, and thank you also everyone who is listening to us online or watching us. Um, I just want to... Um, yeah. Judas Butler argues, I quote, when people gather to resist various form of state and economic power, they are taking risk with their own bodies, exposing themselves to possible harm. And those, I quote, who gather on the street or in public domains where police are present are always at risk of detention and arrest, but also forcible handling, even death. This is because she argues, I quote, all public assembly is haunted by the police and the prison. And every public square is defined in part by the population that could not possibly arrive there. Either they are detained at the border or have no freedom of movement in assembly or are detained or imprisoned. In other words, the freedom to gather as a people is always haunted by the imprisonment of those who exercise that power, who exercise that freedom and were taken to prison. And when, we, when one arrives in public or common spaces with radical and critical views, there is always an anxious or certain unspated that imprisonment will follow. And sometimes we walk or run knowingly in the direction of prison, because it is the only way to expose illegitimate constraints on public assembly and political expression. Everyone, like everyone else, Academic for Peace also knew that all those risks that the Judas Butler talks about it were permanent in Turkey. But neither of them as everyone said that I talked, say they were not expecting to this degree. They thought that a simple act of signing a petition exposing their anger in the dark history of Turkey will be any other activity that will be dismissed, except it didn't. The question to ask why, why such a simple act of Signing a petition demanding for a, a, a peaceful resolution, demanding state um, involvement and resolution of uh, state involvement and turning to dialogue could be a terrorist act or could be punished. Why such an act has become such a life changing experience or in the case of two academics who committed to suicide, life ending experience. And I think that I just want to, uh, I mean, Mehmet talked about how um, the state immediately, all together with state and non-state institution uh, attacked. But just to put a prospect into it, I want to read the President Erdogan response just day after to this petition. And he says, I quote, this mob, which call themselves academic are blaming the government and these poor re replicas of intellectual unfortunate to speak of the state engaging in a massacre. Not only this, they also invite foreigners to monitor developments. This is the mentality of colonialism. Hey, you so-called intellectuals, enlightened ones, you're nothing but dark, dark forces. There is nothing about you that's enlightened. You're so dark and ignorant that you have no idea where the Southeast or the East of this country is. And even 
if mafia leaders threatening the academics, we will spill your blood in streams and we will take a shower in your blood. And another newspaper writer, Jan Kuchuk, writing on 20th of January 2016, this is exactly what we've been trying to explain for the last three years. There is no need to reinvent America. Just like in the West, it is necessary to establish civic death mechanisms. In other words, universities should immediately terminate the employment of these academics before prosecutors step in. Those people should not be able to find job again. Their careers should not end. They should not be able to appear in media. Society automatically excludes them. So, and I think if you put in that prospect, one thing, one thing perhaps to understand why such an anger is not just treat this as a statement or as a simple text, because it never is a simple text or a statement. And we have to then ask, what does this text reveals or not reveals? And what does it propose or not propose? What does it challenges? And what it does it not challenges? And what is radical about it? And we need to locate the text within its both discursive qualities, but also non-discursive qualities, such as history, the context within which it emerge, and what it says, and what relation it is embodied. And this is the kind of thing that I'm going to talk, maybe try to explain the question why. And, and then I think in, in this part, I want to say that the Academic for Peace um, is historically embedded in the um, struggle of academics for uh, against the domination, hegemonic de de domination, control and discipline and uh, neoliberalization of education, commodification of education and the state, like the Mehmet argued, the state use of um, education as a simple ground for constituting new subject for the new uh, emerging uh, republic. As also um, Mehmet argued um, before, the university spaces are central site of contestation, struggle, movement formation in the 60s, 70s and 80s. It is in these campus spaces that a revolutionary movement have emerged. And of course, in response to that also um, a state repression and control and discipline heightened. But also, while historically it's embedded with that, but a contemporary social uh, movement struggle, um, and I think this is really important, I argue that Academics for Peace is not just um, emerge because of this petition, but it is emerged within in the, in the, two, in the in the 2000s, um, when the broader social uh, struggle for social justice and peace uh, started to emerge and social movement um, have demanded peace, equality and democracy. And which was actually kind of manifested with the Gezi Park and the formation of the HDK and the HDP and the women organizations, LG, LGBT, Q's communities. And in that sense, um, the Academic for Peace movement is an integral part of this emerging social, em emerging struggle for social justice and peace. Um, because um, with the opening in the 2000s and with the opening of the peace movement, there was this re realization that the, uh, what they were experiencing in their um, spaces of work, uh, either economically, neoliberalization, neo but also politically, repression, discipline, is one particular expression of injustices that emanating from the same uh, neoliberal economic and political power. And that was a realization that uh, those struggles in these spaces should be also joined with the struggle 
going elsewhere. And it is within this that the uh, academic, the critical intellectual and academics have come to play an important role in these movements and they have joined them. And in that process of learning and these encounters and being together, they collectively created a new knowledge a new, it allowed them to share and go observe the violation in different places, it allowed them to see and engage with society, it allowed them to observe what's going on and how violence is experienced in the Kurdish areas. It allowed academics to see the level of trauma that people were going through, going through. it allowed people to see um, how this daily life that they're far away, these people, have experiencing and things that they have never seen, they've come to see it, it through these interactions and through these encounters with other social movements and with the Kurdish, with the women. And I think it is that moment that the Academics for Peace emerged, emerged and, and developed and lead to the, the petition. Um, and the second one, and I think looking into what that this particular text says, one needs to really read carefully. Uh, in the midst of the brutal violence, it was a deliberate political act that something needs to be done to break the silence where everyone was remaining silent or closing their eyes to what was going over there. And this is particularly important, not just in Turkey, because the fear has already been created by authoritarian uh, practices and which was uh, intensified with the failed military coup. There was already a fear of criminalizations, fear of tension, fear of um, victimization. And I think, but also globally, because of the, in the context of the Syrian war and refugee crisis, there was a globally um, a silence that no one ever wanted to say anything to us what was going over in this conflict. It was in that act of desperation that the academics needed to do something. But it's also not just the, the academics. I think the academics and the commitment, the, the collective power of behind this um, signing um, embodied and signified um, not just the autonomous power of academics, but their collective power with the society. This particular petition also radically refuses and challenges what Barış Ünlü calls Turkishness contract that underlines a particular way of being, knowing and doing the fundamental principle of Turkey's national identity since its creation in 1923. But also I think there was a fear from the government that if they did not block this, this might turn into potential that in, this potentially turn into impossibility into possibility. If this radical ideas uh, come to resonate not just within the campus but outside that it can turn into something different and it was that fear that needed to be crushed. This particular petition also signifies a particular a very radical academic subjectivity and subject breaking the loyalty to the nation and the state society what Mehmet was saying a critical, a critical intellectual commitment, not only to speak to tr speak truth to power, but also act upon that idea. But it also challenges this um, duality between academia somehow isolated from the society or or, or uh, uh, activism, but rather and and sees them as in, interrelated and mutually dependent to each other. Um, as I said before, it's because of that, it recontextualizes academic injustices and oppression as one particular expression emanating from contemporary economic and political power and seeks to connect with other diverse struggle for a new democratic, peaceful and equal Turkey. It's also a radical reconceptualization of Kurdish question 
as highlighted with this radical positive peace demand there's always been the official lines that is where the Kurdish question either considered as a terrorism or a security issue or simply a question of underdevelopment. It rather argues that it is not that the importance, it's not the absence of the violence, but rather changing and reorganizing social structures and power relation in a way that they minimize possi the possibility of future wars. It also challenges what Mehmet said, this paternalist state mentality and its supremacy over its citizens. And, and that is, I think, is one of the big problems that the state itself on the court um, uh, targeted. I mean, that because it's a very important issue in society uh, and social relations. But also it, it, it embodies a, a form of solidarity and it kind of creates not only gives the immediate um, message that you're not alone, but envisages a, a different relationality and sociability within diverse bodies. And it aims to create a true social cohesion rather than one that has been shaped by polarization and division. So in that vulnerability, despair and hope, like anyone else in every situation, violence both challenges, distracts, but also constructs and opens up new possibilities. In this extreme hostile condition, academic for peace have come to develop new repertoires of resistance, defense, solidarity organization. And one of them is was alternative education and knowledge spaces. It started as a campus who's there, no campus movement, then developed into different solidarity academies across Turkey and uh, in, in other uh, and abroad. And recently, Bira Radamin together has created an umbrella organization to bring together all solidarity academies and, and off university in the solidarity academy in Germany is two spaces that has been alternative educational spaces that have been created both to open up spaces for those people have come from you know exiled and and also um and, and sport uh, and also um uh, allow them to carry on their work in in those spaces they also use the um the court process as space of organization mobilization solidarity sport and documenting um, not only defending their academic rights and, and their in, the justices that they have been going through, but also in this course, they turn uh, places where they defend humanity and the goods that are important for humanity. And, and in that, they created this transnational solidarity process, which Mehmet will talk later, and some of the solidarity because he's involved himself actively. Um, all of these practices, in a sense, allow them to rethink education and educational spaces and education activity, both as a meaning, but also practice. How can we reimagine education and knowledge, both in the way that we're thinking about it, but also the meaning, the practice and acting upon that? And I think the, in this alternative education spaces, they've created instead of a hierarchical and top-down state institution, formal, um, where students teach and the, uh, should, um, the, where a, a teacher is the um, ultimate uh, knowledge holder and teaches, and the student always kind of a recipient. And here is a, is a more horizontal, um, more participatory and in democratic environment where teacher um, and student has equal uh, relationship and equally uh, knowledge producer um, and, and then also challenges the formal education. Um, and instead of competition, what it does uh, is focuses on mutual care and sport. And I think by doing that, it is what the um, bell hooks or uh, Judith Butler talks about how uh, vulnerability or in bell hooks is mar marginalization as a site of resistance. And it is through that, that this new critical subject 
um, they have created new critical subject and uh, made education and as emancipatory with the hope that this will turn impossibility into possibility within the crux of capitalism and authoritarian power. I think I will stop there. I think uh, Mehmet now will talk Thank you, Virgil. You need to stop sharing your screen, but good. Yeah. Okay. I will. I will follow from where we left. Uh, Again, thank you, Virgil, uh, for uh, linking the practice with uh, the critical thinking, the critical uh, approach, literature on uh, education, agency, and other issues. Uh, I will, I will uh, say a few words now about what uh, has been done uh, in the process of resisting uh, against state oppression, some of which Birgit has already mentioned. Uh, but I will zoom into a few other examples. Uh, in addition to the establishment of academic and uh, alternative horizontal knowledge spaces, I want to emphasize the kind of solidarity we have ex experienced uh, during this process. Uh, thousands of uh, thousands of academics from all over the world has signed petitions, wrote letters to support the academics for peace. In the UK, uh, UCU, the uh, our our union. <laughs> Higher education unions in France, Germany, uh, lend support. Uh, that was a valuable uh, source of uh, strength for academics for peace. We have also uh, witnessed uh, individual decisions to withdraw cooperation with Turkish higher education bodies like uh, Higher Education Council or the Research Council and universities who were complicit. We have established uh, the list of complicit universities and the kind of complicity they were involved in, so they acted on that basis. We have also uh, secured emergency funding for academics who were fired and blacklisted from the job market. Uh, individual donations and from uh, international uh, European funding. We have also uh, secured placements for a small number of academics uh, through SAR, CARA and faculty invitations. Uh, this process was uh, uh, important in the sense that we learned about the limits that SAR, CARA, or university uh, departments can do because of the financial constraints and because of sometimes um, problematic approach to uh, academics at risk. Uh, and my main observation here is that these types of interventions are post-mortem interventions they do not necessarily strengthen the resilience of uh, the higher education system against state oppression. Uh, they deal with issues after the fact and with a very small number of the issues at that. Uh, we have also witnessed international and national solidarity through monitoring of the trials. Uh, it was a torturous process for many uh, academics, but when they saw their colleagues from other countries uh, monitoring the trials, 
taking the risk to come and uh, stand next to them was a very, very important, uh, uh, valuable source of support for, for, for academics for this. Uh, there are some links you can look at. Uh, I think I will end up with uh, some now concrete examples of uh, alternative or, or, or critical uh, spaces for knowledge production and education that the academics for peace uh, have started to, to produce. Uh, Birgül and in my presentation earlier, we mentioned the fact that off-campus solidarity academies were established, but what are they doing? Two projects that I know uh, of because they were supported by CDPR, of which I'm a trustee member, uh, are the Right to the City project in Izmir and the Alternative Encyclopedia of Turkey project in Mersin, but across Turkey as well. The Right to the City project uh, is conceptualized as a project that would, that would uh, not only enable disadvantaged groups and people in Izmir to have access to law uh, when, when they or their families or friends have been arrested or, or, or prosecuted by the government, but also access to transport, access to uh, uh, urban uh, facilities in general. Also, it aims to encourage and build up empowerment of, of, of the uh, ordinary people in Izmir. Uh, this is uh, funded by uh, European Endowment for Democracy. Uh, sorry, by uh, by 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 a funder, I, I don't know. I don't want to confuse now which one. We have two fund two funders for this. The alternative encyclopedia project. Uh, before we come to that, the Izmir Solidarity, uh, the Right to the City project, is about academics sharing their knowledge of the movements about the right to the city globally with people in Izmir and learning learning from uh, the experience and needs of the people in Izmir to generate a new model, a new uh, framework that can be replicated or can be uh, uh, also encouraged in other, in other contexts, in other, in other urban areas. The Alternative Encyclopedia project, again, it is a, a kind of uh, alternative mode of knowledge uh, production or learning. We aim in this project to produce a alternative encyclopedia of Turkey. In, in terms of history, science, uh, politics, and other aspects, 100 authors will be receiving funding to, to make contributions to this uh, encyclopedia, which will be then published in different platforms and it will have an interactive uh, element with it to uh, generate discussion and uh, additions to, 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 to what is in the original article. It will target higher education, uh, it will target adult education and secondary education. So to sum up, as you can see, uh, the idea that A, the higher education resilience against state interventions and oppression is, a, is an important issue that we need to take in, uh, into account, take guard against, and this resilience may be partly built within the campus and partly outside the campus. I myself put emphasis on the outside campus alternative institutions and initiatives so that A, they are competing 
with the mediocre universities as a source of new knowledge, and B, encouraging further uh, academic uh, criticism within the campus because those who are persecuted and shut down in that platform can find voice and contribute, maintain their involvement in, 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 in critical thinking in other platforms. So I value that, uh, that's why I uh, put this on. It's not intended to uh, sort of uh, publicize what uh, we have been doing, but in terms of uh, deriving what lessons we are, we, are, we are learning from this. Thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion at the end. Thank you. Um, okay, I just really in this last part, I just want to ask a few questions and perhaps rethink about um, ourselves as academics, but also um, our workspace um, academia. And um, I mean, clearly, the case of uh, Academic for Peace shows that human, the uh, higher education spaces are crucial sites of uh, for uh, cr crucial sites for formation of new subjectivities ideas and politics and production of new um, knowledge uh, either from hegemonic or counter hegemonic but it also shows that how um, higher education space is a battle uh, uh, battleground uh, for different contested struggles uh, space of diverse struggles, social transformation, diverse ac actors competing over to reshape according to their social imaginaries, uh, both in terms of democratic participation, autonomy, freedom, but also state repression, regulation and control, and often uh, an, an, an uh, unequal uh, and uneven power relation and uh, influence. But it also show how higher um, education uh, spaces is a constitute part of society with agency and voice rather than an isolated and separated one. Thus, this pushes us to rethink both ourselves as an academic, but also academia in general, um, and how freedom of thought or academic freedom cannot be uh, meaningful uh, by itself if it's not uh, being related or integrated with the other rights, such as right to education, such as right to live and right to um, mother tongue, right to labor and peace. Um, this is really important in the context of Turkey when Mehmet says there are 70,000 students in prison what would it mean for education or academics to carry on freedom of uh, academia or their freedom at the expense of others? How can you teach a very top-down understanding of um, subject when your students are being subjected to discrimination or their simply their rights of education or rights uh, 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 education in mother tongue has been discriminated? It is that perspective that we have to think and incorporate it, freedom of academia to those other freedoms that is needed in the society. Um, and then just as a way of finishing, so just think about this question I put forward to it. And, um, but I wanna finish uh, by a piece um, poem by Yanis Ritros, which uh, has been mentioned and quoted by many of the uh, academic uh, for peace uh, in their court defenses. Um, I won't read it, but I will just leave it there. And um, I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Thanks, Mario. And thanks, Mehmet. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, we are a little bit pushed for time. So I think we can go for a quick five minute uh, uh, buzz in the breakout rooms and then come back for 15 minutes of 
uh, open questions. Um, so I'm going to assign everybody a uh, breakout group and you can just have a few minutes just to absorb some of the content, reflect on that in smaller groups and then I'll bring you back in around five minutes. Okay.
Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Just nod your heads if you can hear. Okay, excellent. I hope you had at least a, a few minutes to, um, to share uh, some reflections. Um, I'm gonna open up now uh, for a Q and A. Um, if, because I can't see everybody on the screen, if you could just put a cross in the chat, if you wanna ask a question or make a contribution, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it in rounds and then go back uh, to Mehmet. So please, um, we've got about 15 minutes to have some Q&A uh, time. So if anybody would like to start the questions. Okay, Genevieve, thank you very much. You're always brave and uh, break the silence. You carry on. Um, yes, it was in relation to, um, in the group, um, we were lucky to have Mehmet there and he raised a, an interesting point around gender and that, that there's a high uh, proportion of women academics as part of the Academics for Peace. And I was interested to know um, how did that, does that sort of dynamic play with the kind of reaction Against against academics from peace from the from the from the government. I just wondered, yeah, whether that was a, a factor as well. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Anybody else? Uh, Alejandro, over to you. I think you're muted. Okay, uh, perfect. Yes, uh, very thank you uh, for your presentation, Mehmet and Birgul. I just have a question about uh, international support. Uh, I was uh, talking with uh, my, my colleagues in, in, in the group uh, about international support. It's not always seen and sometimes is discredited by the governments. Uh, I live in Latin America and here, uh, all kind of international support is, is criminalized or is discredited by the governments, uh, like a communist intervention or some discourse like that. And so, how do you uh, have uh, deal with this uh, with with this issue? Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, if not, I have a question. Uh, okay. So I'm going to um, make the third question then. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I attended uh, a trial, uh, one of these Academics for Peace trials, uh, um, uh, Hamzalu, uh, and it was an incredible experience for us. We were a group of people that were there in solidarity with Onur who'd been imprisoned. Um, and it was incredible, the amount of people that turned up for the court case and uh, to show their solidarity, both international, but also national. And um, the sense of solidarity, and I, I wanted maybe to ask um, uh, both people how that kind of court became a space of, and a site of resistance. Um, because, you know, often we see the court as being the kind of, you know, a site of punishment. But it seemed to me that in, in that context, it also became a real site of resistance. So maybe you could you could also answer that. So uh, I think you have three nice questions to start you off. Do you want to go? Who wants to go first? I, I might go first. Okay. Um, I... I think uh, the first question was uh, about uh, women. Uh, uh, the, uh, is it okay? C can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes. yes it was yes, about the role, role of women in in in, uh, in higher education and the academics for peace movement, particularly. Uh, yes, the number of women going to higher education, not only uh, higher education, but also further research and academic uh, career has increased significantly in the nine, from the 1990s onward. And the women uh, colleagues have introduced new dimensions into the curriculum and the teaching of, uh, in, in higher education institutions, particularly in universities where there was a, a critical level of quality to start with, like Wazich University, uh, 
Middle East Technical University or uh, some of the new private universities like Bilgi University uh, can be mentioned here. I think one, one dimension that has uh, uh, brought in by these colleagues is either in sociology or communications or in history, challenging uh, paternalism or patriarchy and in relation to that state oppression. State determination of the lives of ordinary citizens have been challenged. They also uh, raised awareness uh, about uh, the importance of peace, peaceful resolution of the Kurdish conflict. They also raised awareness about the uh, need to uh, go beyond the Turkish, uh, Turkish, Turkish fetishism and celebrating diversity. Uh, that, that was a, a hugely important contribution. Uh, that's my take on the first question. Uh, international support, uh, it, the question is, 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 is very, very pertinent. We have it, had, uh, or the academics for peace have had the same experience. Uh, the support has been criminalized uh, uh, and they have been uh, sort of presented as uh, foreign interventions in, in, into Turkish uh, Judiciary, judiciary, judiciary system and other 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 uh, nonsense. However, uh, I think uh, this has uh, been sort of effective in shaping only the perceptions of their supporters rather than the rest of the society. The rest of society did not see a conspiracy theory here. But the state has tried to block or prevent these types of international connections. We, we know that uh, they, uh, in fact, in this emergency project, we had to go through very, very uh, intricate uh, ways in which we can uh, send uh, financial support to academics for peace because the state might confiscate them. Uh, that's 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 fact uh, of life in 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 uh, these autocratic uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, uh, what what helps is uh, having having good relations, uh, links, uh, institutional or individual uh, with the international academic community matters, and when you tap on the right link, you usually uh, get uh, important feedbacks and support. Uh, this site, the court as a site of solidarity uh, is, is a good uh, phrase. I like that. Uh, but this is, to be honest with you, uh, has got a history in Turkey as well. It is a, a creative recreation of that tradition, but the court has always been a site of resistance and, and solidarity in, 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 in Turkish uh, political uh, struggle for democracy and justice. Um, maybe I just want to add something about, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, in relation to gender, I think um, apart from this, uh, the changing gender dynamics of higher education and their effect on uh, higher education, curriculum, pedagogy and everything, I think one important dynamic to say overall, um, the women movement um, in general has been the forefront of the struggle against these hegemonic gender norms and values. Uh, what uh, has been reshaped by the academic is in new Islamic values. What this academic re represented is a new, is opposite, um, a radical uh, militant academics who were not staying at home, who was not the honorable woman that the AKP was describing. And I think that, um, of course, it, it kind of challenges the public perceptions of these hegemonic women and what needs to be done. And, and, and 
and I think it was one of the uh, dimension that created a lot of anger, no doubt, uh, not just this anti-intellectual, uh, anti-academic environment that within the AKP or AKP uh, trying to manipulate, but it was also clearly um, because of the role of women and the, in challenging these hegemonic uh, gender norms, uh, I could say that was also clearly the case, um, the level of anger and revenge that targeted to that. Um, and, and I think um, in terms of solidarity, I think Mario, um, Mario's question, Mehmet is, is, as Mehmet said, it, it's, it, it's historically been a site of solidarity uh, and struggle. But however, I think when the spaces are closed down on you and we're in a, in a kind of extreme authoritarian conflict, imagining there's no spaces for you. These are the spaces that created by top down and the only way you can do by attending to these places. And I think then in those kind of author extreme authoritarian contexts, it's become more so it's a site of uh, deliberate, but it doesn't happen by itself. And there is a, I think important to notice, there is an incredible amount of effort labor and care that goes into creating this space a site of solidarity and struggle. And, and I think that um, they either they had to uh, stay silent or it was a conscious decision, let's turn this, not just site of solidarity and a struggle, but documenting documenting a crime that is taking place, documenting and creating a historical memory. And I think that's why, even though there was one, the government has tried to uh, separate these cases and put everyone as individual in different countries, in different cities and different courts, one of the things that, okay, let's turn them as a collective struggle and draw attention to that and use these spaces to document all the things that's happening for future generation. And I think I didn't have time, unfortunately, to maybe quote some of these statements that has been done on the basis of why they are doing this, why they are documenting this, why they are giving this statement, why it would have been amazing, maybe another time if anyone is interested, I can forward to that. But yeah, I could say this for now. Uh, any final question, uh, Nimi? I'm going to let you have the uh, last question and then uh, I'll ask them to close. <laughs> Thanks, Mario. That uh, was a really wonderful and rich session. Thank you so much, Mehmet and Bogut. I wanted to know, you spoke a lot about solidarity um, within the academic community um, in Turkey and then outside of Turkey, but I wanted to know um, what kind of support or criticism has there been within Turkey outside of academia? For example, from trade unions, um, from religious civil society, um, and so on. Um, have people been uh, critical of the academics or have they been attempting to support the academics and how has that worked? Miguel, do, do you want to go first this time? Uh, I don't mind. Um, yeah. Yes, um, when we said that, of course, um, as positioning that they have, it always creates um, lots of tension and lots of criticism. But in this case, even attacks, verbal attacks, death threats, not just ordinary people within academia, outside academia, but by the other pro-government trade unions, by the other uh, social movements that are close to the um, government. Uh, it was not all um, problem-free or, or a uniform solidarity. It was the extreme hostility and criticism at the same time they have, uh, they have had uh, uh, throughout this process. Um, and I think this is important to note that from the second day that the day after the, the, um, the petition signed, um, the government 
uh, with the media, with the media that it manipulates, uh, and the TV channels, they virtually publish their names um, and their ideas defamated what they're thinking and they made them very visible, they turned them into visible targets, but target as a terrorist, target as a traitor, as the one that who wants to destroy the government because they are charged with the criminal charge was of making terrorist propaganda. It wasn't freedom of thought or freedom of ideas. So imagine the context that Mehmet just provided in a where um, this top-down state fetishism and state as a level of analysis and embedded within the society and you every day bombarded with this, the other terrorists, they are traitors, and of course it's created. And that was the case in, in the Academic for, his, for Peace as well. They, on the road, they've been targeted and there are lots of criticism on the social media, death threats in their emails. Many have to leave uh, or change their cities um, or their, even their houses in order not to be known. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you, Virgil. Uh, I will add one or two things. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the support and solidar support for and solidarity with Academics for Peace in Turkey has run along the political division line. Uh, uh, but again, a bit of historical context here. The Turkish mainstream media and institutions, and they tried, uh, they have divided the working uh, class movement or trade union movement into state loyal and non-state loyal or slightly critical lines for a long time anyway. That's part of the working uh, class movement, the state-sponsored trade unions, the most of the uh, business and commerce organizations always play the same tune, whether it is the occupation of Cyprus, it was the occupation of Cyprus, whether or whether it was the crashing of the Kurd, Kurdish uh, uh, struggle for freedom, or whether it is uh, uh, crashing the socialist uh, revolutionary uh, ideas and movements, they always play the same tune, uh, the same tune as the state. They are orchestrated. Uh, without going too much into the details, uh, there are lots of grotesque details here, but let's not skip into that. However, the solidarity and uh, support, we, the Academics for Peace received was quite uh, wide ranging in Turkey, despite the, 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 the state sponsored uh, media and organization uh, attacks on, on, on them. Lots of um, internet based news outlets, tens of them. Uh, the uh, human rights organizations, the Turkish Human Rights uh, Institute uh, or, or, or a foundation, Turkish uh, Human Rights Foundation, human rights organization, uh, the part of the trade union movement, they have all been uh, supportive. Uh, also, uh, we know that the families and the social network of the families is, was another major support. The families did not left, did not leave their uh, sons, daughters, or brothers or sisters uh, vulnerable. Uh, they they owned them. They provided financial support uh, and. Uh, uh, the housing support, whatever. Uh, the Academics for Peace stories resonated within the local communities as well. Uh, 
Uh, so if we go back to the education side of this, um, uh, the education uh, establishment uh, was against him, but lots of teachers in, in high schools, uh, uh, in uh, secondary schools also uh, uh, put support statements through their unions and through their local um, demonstrations. So that's, uh, I would say, about the solidarity. It's always a, a two-sided picture, uh, and the political polarization uh, encouraged by the autocratic regimes make this uh, division more clearer in every, uh, in every major uh, initiative that the state doesn't like. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to both uh, Mehmet and Birgul for what I think was a really rich and, and, and excellent session. Really thank good you. questions. I have a very, I, I forgot to mention this in the questions, uh, but I have a very nice takeaway from Mehmet, yeah, which I wrote down, which was there is an inverse relationship between a compliant uh, and passive academic community and uh, quality research. So next time uh, any of us meets our vice chancellors, we should say that a radical university uh, produces much better research and teach yeah, than the passive and compliant ones. So I don't know whether yeah, you can yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, now, thank you very much uh, to, to you both and also to all the participants. This one went a little longer thank than you. normal. Uh, and I apologize uh, for that if I've kept we've kept anyone a little too long. Um, next week's session is uh, from Dr. Kelsey Shanks from the University of Ulster, um, also co-PI on the uh, peer network, and she'll be talking about the politics and policy of education in Iraq. Uh, Kelsey has worked both from a PhD and onwards in a lot of projects in Iraq on what happened after the invasion, reconstruction of uh, education system in Iraq, the divisions, issues around language and the politics of language in Iraq. So um, I'm sure that one's gonna be a really interesting session. Um, thanks everybody uh, for Thank attending. You all. And uh, please uh, invite your friends for the next session and uh, encourage them to follow up on YouTube uh, and catch up on any of the sessions that they might have missed. And uh, have a good day to you, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.